As everyone knows, wandering scholars were very common in the early Middle Ages. And part of what enabled them to be wandering scholars was that while wandering, they could count on free accommodation at monasteries and royal courts. But of course, not everybody's credentials as a wandering scholar could be accepted at first blush. The court of Gwynedd in North Wales in the early 9th century imposed a test of academic credibility on wandering scholars who happened to turn up, especially from Ireland. <laughs> a little verbal puzzle was set for these wandering scholars, and its solution required a knowledge of the Greek alphabet. We know this because there's a letter from an emigre Irish scholar in France to friends in Ireland giving away the answer. <laughs> But this delightful little vignette tells us three significant things about that period. One is that it was quite reasonable to expect Irish scholars to know a bit of Greek. The second thing it tells us, incidentally, is that not every Irish scholar knew quite as much Greek as he was expected to know. And the third thing is that the court of North Wales in the ninth century was self-consciously trying to uphold academic standards. And it's against that background that I want to discuss our third text, the Historia Britonum, written in 828, 829, so far as we can work out, and normally ascribed to a scholar of the period called Nennius, or Ninius. Unfortunately, the ascription only comes in a rather late manuscript, along with a prologue about which more in a moment. So it's not particularly safe to identify the author with this otherwise moderately well-known Welsh scholar of the period. If I slip occasionally into referring to the author of the Historia Britonum as Nennius, that's just to save myself saying the author of the Historia Britonum all the time. The prologue to the work, which begins by saying that the writer is indeed Nennius, disciple of Bishop Elvodu, of Bangor, whom we know from other sources. The author describes how he has brought together material from British chronicles, Roman chronicles, Saxon and Irish annals, and the lives of the saints. And he's brought them together, he says rather touchingly, in a heap. Co acervavi, I have piled up the material. It's a word which has done the author no favours over the centuries. People have imagined that he's a rather random writer, simply magpie-like, picking details from hither and yon in a chaos of materials. But if the prologue to the work is indeed a late and spurious addition, what we see there is simply some later editor retrojecting what might have been the habits of an author of the ninth century. In order to produce a work like this, you would have to know material from British, Roman, Irish, and Saxon chronicles. So the assumption made by that later editor is there must have been such chronicles. Current scholarship is very skeptical indeed of the existence of British chronicles prior to the Historia, and is almost equally skeptical of the systematic use of much of the other material mentioned there. And to speak of that rather later edition or emendation of the work is to remind ourselves that works like this in the early Middle Ages were very frequently edited and re-edited on a regular basis, just as the chronicles of the age were supplemented as time went on. But at least that spurious preface to the work once again tells us a few things of significance. Not least that this is recognizably a work which attempts self-consciously to draw together a very diverse range of materials. This is not just a history from one point of view or with one set of perspectives. 
And it is indeed interesting to note that the use of Anglo-Saxon source material, including Anglo-Saxon genealogies, is very much in evidence, despite this being a history of the British. So it's a work which makes some sense against what I've described as the rather self-conscious adherence to high academic standards of the court of Gwynedd at the time. Self-conscious, but I suspect just a little exaggerated. I don't think there were very many devoted Hellenists in De Ganwy in 828 or so. Nonetheless, a memory of classical scholarship is still around, and expectations about the knowledge of Greek are certainly part of the self-image of Irish, and one imagines, therefore, to a lesser extent, British clerical scholarship. The greatest scholar of the age, John Scotus Eugena, was, as the name indicates, an Irishman with an unparalleled knowledge of Greek in Western Europe for the period, and someone who drew into his own theological and philosophical reflection <clears throat> a very wide range of material from the Eastern Christian world. But that's another story. But why should the court of Gwynedd have been self-consciously devoted to these standards? Why should it have seen itself as the kind of cultural centre which could not afford to let Irishmen slip through the scholarly net too easily? The answer is that at this period, the North Welsh Kingdom had undergone a fairly major political upheaval. What's usually referred to as the First Dynasty of Gwynedd seems to have come to an end in the early 9th century, and although we don't quite know by what process, a new dynasty was establishing itself, having married into what was left of the old. And the first king of this new dynasty has the unforgettable name of Mervyn the Freckled. Mervyn Vrich. It's quite clear that under the leadership of Mervyn, the North Welsh Kingdom was seeking to establish itself as the guardian of British identity in Western Britain. We know that in this period of the long rivalry with the Mid-Welsh Kingdom of Powys was more or less resolved in favour of Gwynedd. And it sounds very much as if the author of the Historia Britonum was somebody who came from another part of Wales originally. He's particularly well informed about folklore from the southeast of Wales, from Gwent and Mid Wales, the area then called Bircht, now around Bilth, Bilth Wells. Which suggests, in turn, that the author had, so to speak, opted for Gwynedd as the best political bet in Wales of that day had opted for this court and this scholarly community as the best guardian of the traditions of Britishness. We'll see in a moment what he meant by that. But we can, I think, take it for granted that despite modern scepticism about the existence in some library in northwest Wales of British, Roman and Saxon chronicles, we are dealing with a writer who has access to written materials, and we are dealing also with a culture, a scholarly culture, in which at least some written material in the Greek alphabet is not unfamiliar, which in turn suggests a continuing close relationship with some of the great scriptoria and monasteries of Ireland. The point was made over half a century ago by the great Nora Chadwick that nowhere in Wales do we find any indication of a monastic scriptorium or a cathedral scriptorium as wealthy, as well endowed as those in Ireland in a corresponding period? And yet again, as we'll see in a moment, there's some evidence at least that something of the tradition which we were discussing in the first of these lectures had survived. So the motivation for a comprehensive scholarly history using diverse materials, a history of the British, but written in the interest of a particular claimant to British hegemony, that all of that was connected with the project of King Mervyn in Gwynedd in the early 9th century. And that what we're reading, therefore, 
is a bid to define a new kind of Welshness, not only over against the Anglo-Saxons, but in relation to a much longer and more complex tradition. The author of the Historia is quite clearly interested in assimilating into North Welsh history aspects of the history of other parts of non-Anglo-Saxon Britain, which is why he has some sections on what's often called in Welsh the Hernogled, the Old North, that is the British Kingdom of Southern Scotland and Cumbria and Lancashire, which figure very largely in early Welsh heroic poetry. He also mentions, as a great king in his own age, the figure of Malgon King Maglacunis of Gwynedd, who's mentioned by Gildas, an identification which I think is reasonably secure despite some um, scholarly hesitations here and there. Very puzzlingly, he introduces a rather rootless little chapter, though remarkably tightly composed, dealing with the legendary figure of Arthur. He doesn't locate Arthur anywhere in particular, and that has been a problem to generations of Arthurian enthusiasts who have wanted to demonstrate that King Arthur was really Scottish, Welsh, Cornish, Lancastrian, or whatever. But I suspect that the catalogue of battles in that chapter about Arthur is part of the historian's deliberate strategy of broadening out a British and Welsh and North Welsh history to cover a very, very wide range of traditions and historical recollections. Certainly one of Arthur's battles in that chapter seems to have been fought in southern Scotland. But I think it would be very rash to assume that that means they all were. Just as it's very rash to assume that they were all fought by one person called Arthur mention of a battle fought in the city of the Legion probably refers to the Battle of Chester, the beginning of the 7th century, long after the time of the other battles that are mentioned. The Battle of Mount Baden, probably again in Somerset, is associated by Gildas and Bede with the figure of Ambrosius rather than with Arthur, and again suggests that broad geographical span which the historian Pseudo Nennius or whoever is trying to suggest as the background of this new Welsh identity. He includes a great deal of material whose sources are completely obscure to us. Where Bede has a very brief mention of the Anglo Saxon settlement being encouraged and supported by wicked King Vortigern, I mentioned last time, giving us thereby a very useful clue as to his own use of British manuscript sources. Nennius has a long section on Vortigern, which draws heavily on folklore themes and what are obviously legends about the fifth century. Vortigern here is portrayed systematically as a diabolically evil ruler. He's in persistent conflict with Saint Germanus, whom we've also met before. He attempts to take the life of the young Ambrosius, and he commits all kinds of what, on the basis of reading Gildas, one would assume to be routine royal sins of the British fifth and sixth century. Perhaps equally importantly, we have, from roughly the same period, a memorial pillar set up in mid-Wales, the so-called Pillar of Elisek. This has carved on it, now in barely legible form, but it was transcribed a few centuries ago, a genealogy of the kings of mid-Wales. And they trace their origin to no less than Vortigern. Vortigern here is the parent of a monarch who is blessed by St. Germanus, rather than the opposite. It's as if the two kingdoms of Mid and North Wales are presenting different versions of 5th century history, in one of which Vortigern is an unredeemed villain, 
in the other of which Vortigern is a revered ancestor. Sorting out the details of this has kept many scholars in business for many decades, and I'll spare you the details. But it's a reminder of some of what the Historia Britonum is attempting to do. It's also notable that in the Historia, we have a quite well-informed and sympathetic summary of the origins of the Irish people. It's clear that the author of the Historia is familiar with some form of what we know in Irish literature as the Book of Innovations. That is the legendary history of ancient Ireland where a succession of <clears throat> tribes and peoples invade Ireland from different quarters and represent, as it were, different stages of civilization in Ireland. Nennius, or whoever he is, knows that tradition reasonably well in some early form. He's not at all anti-Irish, in fact, but he does remind us that the roots of the Irish are, in fact, barbaric. The Irish started off as Scythians. And of course, if you're a Greek or Latin speaker, you will know that Scythians are the worst kind of barbarian. Nennius modifies this slightly by allowing us to believe that the Scythians, who were the ancestors of the Irish, were quite nice barbarians. <laughs> For some reason, they'd landed up in Egypt at the time of the Exodus. And they'd been very friendly and sympathetic towards the Israelites at the time of the Exodus, and had therefore been exiled by the Egyptians, and had very naturally taken themselves off to Ireland. Part of what's going on here is, I think, that the writer of the Historia is looking at what is said in some of his earlier sources, and said in Bede indeed, about the Scythian origins of the Picts in Northern Britain. And a little bit of confusion of Picts and Scots is already going on long before 1066 and all that. But that reference to the barbarian origins of the Irish only helps up to point out the extraordinary story that Nennius has to tell about British origins. The British are the descendants of the Trojans. This is Nennius's great contribution to European literature. There were many peoples and many communities which appear to have talked about, speculated about Trojan ancestry in late antiquity. There's a passing hint in one late classical historian that there were Celtic tribes in Gaul which spoke about their origins in the Trojan War, presumably under the influence of Roman neighbors. But it's Nennius who first gives us a story, or rather two stories, about the origins of Britain from the Trojan royal family. Brutus, who gave his name to Britain, is a descendant of Aeneas. And the writer of the Historia knows of two diverse versions of that story, in which Brutus is exiled from, or voluntarily leaves, the Italy of Aeneas and his family, and settles in Britain, giving the island his name. It's very difficult indeed to see what precisely the sources might be for this. There's absolutely no prior text in any language or any context which suggests that story. The encyclopedic work of Isidore of Seville in the sixth century, which covers the origins of all the nations, mentions no such tradition about Britain. Indeed, Isidore is rather rude about Britain. He says that some people say that the island of Britain takes its name from the fact that the inhabitants are bruty, stupid. I have a speculation here that Welsh scholars or British scholars of the seventh century, reading Isidore and his use of that word bruti, his use of the Latin adjective brutus for the British, are deliberately making a rebuff. Yes, we are indeed as British deriving our name from brutus, but not from the adjective in common use as stupid, but from that well-known and celebrated Roman family whose achievements were so familiar with in the history of Rome from its earliest days 
to the murder of Julius Caesar. This may have begun, and this is very much a speculation, as a kind of literary joke among classically well-educated clergy and clerks in the sort of community we were thinking about in the first of these lectures. That is the well-read, rather self-consciously literary, rather self-consciously elegant stylists of little villa-based communities in Western Britain, the sort of environment from which Gildas came, the sort of house which St. Ishtid seems to have governed. And it perhaps was the case that, as occasionally happens in history, what began as a wry joke at the expense of Isidore of Seville turned into a little saga of its own. But I do believe that the author of the Historia had some written sources here. I believe that for two reasons. One is that both versions of the Brutus story which he gives contain extensive genealogies. And some of the somewhat garbled forms of personal names in those genealogies might suggest miscopyings rather than mishearings of names. The second point is a little bit more recondite, and I won't go into too much detail about it, but the story of Brutus's birth and youth in the first version that Nennius gives is a little puzzling. Brutus's parents, when he's born, are told a prophecy by a neighboring magician that the child will grow up to be deeply loved and highly successful. And they then have the magician executed. In later life, Brutus is responsible for the accidental killing of his parents. Classical themes are clearly around here. But it sounds very much as if what has happened is that a paragraph has slipped out. That as in so many legendary stories, the prophecy was that the child would indeed be beloved and successful, but would kill his parents. And it's exactly this version of the story that we find 300 years after the Historia Britonum in Geoffrey of Monmouth's great history of the kings of Britain. I don't for a moment believe that Geoffrey had independent access to a source used by Nennius, but I do believe that Geoffrey was an extraordinarily intelligent, imaginative writer and reader who could see that there was some kind of lacuna in what had been copied out here. So somewhere behind the story in the Historia Britonum, I believe, is another bundle of written sources. Not British chronicles, but it may be notes, it may be marginalia, perhaps even marginalia in a manuscript of Isidore of Seville, built up by other writers presented as some kind of traditional history by the time of Nennius. But what's interesting about this association with Troy is that it is, of course, implicitly a claim for Britain to be on a par with Rome. The British and the Romans alike derive from Troy. The story of Aeneas, and we've already seen how massively influential and widespread the use of Virgil still is in this literature. The history of Troy is the source of both Roman and British identity. So Britishness is here identified not exactly with Romanitas, with Roman identity, but with a kind of parallel track classical ancestry. The British are to be taken as seriously as the Greeks and the Romans because their origins lie in Troy, back beyond the beginnings of Roman Empire. So, curiously enough, the one thing that the Historia Britonum does not do is to go back to the quarrel between Gildas and Bede over who the chosen people are. The writer of the Historia Britonum is not particularly interested in claiming for the British the status of a chosen people, even in opposition to Bede's claim that the English are the chosen people. He takes a very different path, 
cutting round, so to speak, at an angle to that debate and identifying the British with Trojans, Romans, and indeed in his genealogies interweaving also Greek ancestry too. So he's making a claim for a parity with civilized antiquity. The claim to familiarity with Greek in ninth century Wales was not just a minor quirk of the royal court. It illustrates something about the self-awareness of the learned class in Western Britain by this time. And I'll return a bit later to some of the long-term implications of this intriguing story and intriguing identification. But before moving on, it's worth just noting in passing that Ninius, or whoever he is, is not completely indifferent to biblical typologies. In his brief and rather condensed account of the life of St. Patrick, he notes towards the end that there are several ways in which St. Patrick resembles Moses. Because he seems here to be dependent on an Irish life of St. Patrick, rather than on Patrick's own confession, he's probably picking up a theme that had become conventional in Ireland by that time, Patrick as <clears throat> the leader of God's new people in Ireland is someone who can be seen as a kind of Moses for the Irish. The lack of knowledge of Patrick's own work is a curiosity here. I noted that neither Gildas nor Bede mentions Patrick, that if they if Gildas mentions him indirectly, which he just may do, it's not in a very friendly way. But here the tradition has come back from Ireland to Wales, and here it is inserted at a very strategic point and at some length in the history of the British. Patrick is implicitly claimed for the British by this means, and the story of his capture by the Irish and his later escape from slavery is mentioned very, very briefly in passing with none of the elaboration you find in Patrick's own account of these events. And he's then firmly tied down to a biblical typology. Nicholas Hyam, one of the foremost scholars of this period, has suggested that that might prompt us to read the following chapter on Arthur as based on a Joshua typology. Arthur is described in the Latin text as Dux Bellorum, the leader of the wars, just as Joshua in the Latin Bible is Dux Belli, the leader of the war. I'll admit to being agnostic about this particular suggestion, but it fits quite well with the Patrick typology, <clears throat> and it fits in a general world of assimilating recent history to biblical history. But my hesitation is simply due to the fact that I don't see the Historia overall as nearly as interested in biblical typology as either Gildas or Bede. So the jury is perhaps still out on that. Thus far then, we've seen that the Historia Britonum comes out of a self-consciously learned tradition in a cultural context where it's quite important for a slightly arrivist court in North Wales to establish its credentials, its cultural credentials. We've seen that it is struggling to keep up with the Irish reputation for scholarship by making much of its acquaintance, however thin, with the Greek language. And we've seen that as part of that cultural world, the legend of Britain's origins in classical antiquity, in the Trojan War, and in the Virgilian world is affirmed as the origin story of the British people. In opposition to both the Irish, who although amiable are still at bottom barbarians, and the Anglo-Saxons, who are not even amiable. 
some confirmation of this ambitious self-crafting that's going on in the Historia Britonum can be found from a, a very different source. One of the things that Nennius mentions in passing in the Historia is that the 6th century was a period of great poetic achievement. And he names four poets from northern Britain, that is, from the southern Scotland, Cumbria, Lancashire region. From that period, who are clearly seen as the paradigm poets of their day. They include the figure of Anairin, or Nairin, author of the Godothin, that great epic poem about the defeat of the British by the Angles at the Battle of Catraith, sometime in the 590s, perhaps. More significantly, there's mention of the poetry of Taliesin. And we have ascribed to Taliesin about a dozen poems whose location is indeed the Old North, the Cumbrian kingdom of Reged, in the 6th century. The poems as we have them can't in fact be 6th century. Their language is manifestly later. But there's quite a good case for seeing them in their present form as 9th century. In other words, they come from much the same era as the work of Nennius. There may be earlier elements within them. Some of them may be rewritings in slightly more contemporary Welsh of older texts. But the interesting thing is that in Wales, in the 9th century, somebody was collecting or revising or reworking traditions about Northern Britain as part of the literary heritage of North Wales. That fits, as I think you'll agree very nicely, with this picture of a court in North Wales determined to establish itself as the centre, the cultural centre of Britishness, drawing into its orbit, so to speak, the history of the Old North. Just as in the history of the British, we have a section on precisely the royal patron whom some of Taliesin's poems address, King Irian of Reged, last quarter of the sixth century, as far as we can tell. So, the history of conflict between British and English, represented by some of these ancient poems and by some of the traditions about Reged that Nennius reproduces, the tradition of conflict between the British and the English is revived in the context of Welsh self-consciousness in the ninth century. And the old trope of how British Christians resist Germanic paganism is clearly at work. In the chapter on the battles of Arthur, it's made very clear that Arthur is a devout Christian. In one of his battles, he carries an image of the mother of God into battle with him. Similarly, in the struggles of Irian of Reged against the Angles of Northumbria, it's made reasonably clear that he is a Christian fighting pagans. And in some of the poems ascribed to Taliesin, Irian is given the very evocative and interesting title of Eid Bedith, literally the Lord of Baptism, or the Commander of the Faithful. That's to say, he is presented, again very self-consciously, as representing a Christian civilized world over against Germanic barbarity and paganism. And although, of course, by the ninth century, the English were Christians, it doesn't hurt Menius's aims to suggest, in a roundabout sort of way, by the use of the material that he uses, by the tropes he uses in talking about Arthur, that the English may look Christian, but real Christianity still belongs on the British side of the divide. It means that in the ninth century, the Welsh court and its intellectual elite are quite deliberately reviving a semi-legendary pattern of struggle between British and English. The English, of course, in the ninth century are in quite an expansionist mood. 
some of the lesser Welsh kingdoms in the 9th and 10th centuries end up as tributaries to their English neighbours. And so to dust off the old tradition of warfare between the rightful owners of the island and the pagan invaders is yet again an appropriate and perfectly intelligible move for a 9th century Welsh historian to make. And somewhere around this period, certainly between the 9th and the 11th century, we find the beginnings of a genre of Welsh po early medieval Welsh poetry, which could be described as roughly nationalist prophecy. That's to say, pseudo-prophetic texts looking forward to the day when the British once again recover their rightful control of the island of Britain. The greatest and the longest example of this, preserved interestingly enough in the so-called Book of Taliesin, is the Armes Prydain, whose earliest form may be 9th or 10th century, though we don't quite know. North Wales, then, is the new rallying point for British identity. The North Welsh Kingdom is the true heir of all the heroic traditions of earlier Britain, especially the heroic traditions around those figures, those semi-legendary figures, who fought against the invaders, like Arthur and Irian. It's also a community which looks back to remote origins, which set it up in a kind of cultural parity with Rome itself. And to go back to the anecdote with which I began, it struggles, as I say, to maintain some viable contact with the classical languages. What then was in Nennius's library? Presumably at the ecclesiastical centre of Bangor in northwest Wales. He has all the usual things that we've come to associate with British chroniclers. He's reading Jerome and Eusebius, he now has Isidore at his disposal. He has Bede, too, at his disposal. He knows the universal history of Erosius, as everybody does. And in that sense, his library is an orthodox, in the looser sense, British library of the period. He has the books we might expect. It seems he also has access to some Irish annals, perhaps Paschal Chronicles, like the one I've mentioned before. He has access to some traditions about indigenous literature, probably oral. It's notable that although he has quite a bit to say about King Irian of Reged, the traditions he reproduces have no parallel at all in the poetic material about King Irian associated with the work of Taliesin. So we don't know if he really knew any epic poems about the period. Nonetheless, there's a case for saying that in several passages of the Historia, the simplest explanation for the way the story evolves is some kind of knowledge of a poem in the British language. Much ink has been spilled once again over the Arthurian question. For a long time it was taken for granted that the list of Arthur's battles in the Historia was a Latin translation of some early British poem about Arthur's achievements. More recent scholarship, especially the work of Guy Hulsall, has pointed out that this particular passage of the Historia is very, very carefully crafted, even down to word count. In other words, it's most unlikely to be a translation of an existing text, but equally unlikely to have been composed from scratch. And Hulsell himself admits that it's perfectly possible, I would say overwhelmingly likely, that there's one or more um, earlier poetic sources behind it, even if it's not originally a poem about Arthur. It's a wide library, therefore, but not particularly deep. It's an antiquarian's library rather than a historian's in the fullest sense. And that, I think, shows itself most of all in 
the enthusiasm that the writer of the Historia shows for genealogies. He will, at the least excuse, give you a long royal genealogy to break up his story. Genealogies of the Anglo-Saxons, of the British, of Brutus and his family, and anybody else you care to name, really. And that, as I say, is more of a local antiquarian's habit than a historian's in the stricter sense. It may reflect written sources. As I've suggested, there are misspellings and mistranscriptions, or apparently misspellings and mistranscriptions, in what he has which suggest that he was copying something. So it's a library which includes some indigenous poetry in some form, even if only in the form of an informant. And it includes some of that scholarly fantasy, which I've argued lies behind the Brutus legend. And it includes a new kind of hagiography, a new kind of literature about the saints. A literature which is some way removed from the kind of source that Gildas, for example, or even Bede uses about the saints. St. Germanus and St. Patrick are, in the Historia Britonum, almost indistinguishable. They are standard-issue saints. They go around performing wonders and rebuking tyrants, which is what saints do, but not very specifically. So unspecific is the story about Germanus that there's absolutely no mention of the historical circumstances which Bede reproduces so painstakingly in his history. If Nennius knew anything about the supposed Pelagian problem in Britain in the 5th century, he certainly concealed that knowledge. Germanus, as I say, is a standard issue saint, which has led many people to suppose that the Germanus of the Historia is not in fact the same person as the one mentioned at such length by Bede, but maybe um, a local border Welsh saint, Mid Wales, Shropshire, um, whose name is preserved in St. Harmon in the border area, and who may or may not be the same as the Germanus or Garmon commemorated in the Isle of Man and indeed in Cornwall. We have no way of disentangling all this, but the one thing we can be sure of is that narratives reproduced by Nennius are not of the same kind as the early chronicles of the saints, the records in Bede, not only of Germanus, but of course of Augustine and Aidan. These are not lives at close quarters. The British then are the ancient proprietors of the land, and their ancient legitimate proprietorship of the island is somehow reinforced by that sense of classical antiquity behind them. Anglo-Saxondom intrudes on this ancient and semi-sacred identity, this proprietorship. But there's at the same time a recognition that that proprietorship is realistically a thing of the past. If it's to come back into existence, it has to be fought for. The legacy of the governance of the island is now in abeyance and only extant in Wales. Happily, with the advent of the new dynasty in Gwynedd, there is, Nennius implies, literally a fighting chance that Wales may recover some of the ancient British glory. But for now, the Kingdom of Gwynedd and Merwin Vrich can congratulate itself that it is indeed the legitimate heir of Brutus and of Arthur and of Irian and of Patrick, the Moses of Ireland. It can congratulate itself on having preserved that ancient identity and never having given up its claims to legitimate authority over the island. And that leads me finally to some thoughts about the irony of what the Historia achieves. I mentioned a little while ago the way in which Geoffrey of Monmouth takes up this story in the 12th century. Geoffrey's history of the kings of Britain from that period is a work which I think you could properly call the Tolkien of its day. It was the great imaginative fiction that provided a corporate myth 
for a people in search of a corporate myth. If you can imagine Lord of the Rings being presented as a plausible national history, you'll get some sense of how the history of the Kings of Britain worked. It is a quite brilliant work. It's written with immense energy and imagination and even occasionally wit. It's completely unscrupulous in its use of sources. It simply fabricates. It's a great historical novel. It plunders the work of classical historians and it shakes out a bag full of names from Welsh genealogies and organizes them in completely arbitrary patterns as king lists from ancient Britain. As you all know, Geoffrey of Monmouth is remotely responsible for quite a lot of Shakespeare, in the form of King Lear and Cymbeline at the very least, responsible for the amazing efflorescence of the Arthurian legend in the Middle Ages and much else beside. But what Geoffrey does is to pick up Nennius's Brutus story and make it not just a story about the Welsh, but a story about some new reality, newly conceived 12th century reality, which is the kingdom of Britain as understood by the Plantagenets. We've already seen that the Welsh are manifestly not in charge of the island of Britain, and Geoffrey hastens to tell us that that's because they don't deserve to be. The Welsh have long since abandoned the glory of their ancestors and are now a decadent and unwarlike race, a theme which we've already seen at work in Gildas and Bede. Nennius valiantly, appropriately, fights back against that stereotype. But for Geoffrey, the Welsh have essentially lost it, and the Saxons have never had it. So, with the arrival of the Normans and the establishment of the Plantagenet dynasty, we have now a chance to reimagine Britishness on a quite new scale. Arguments about who the chosen people are are now in the remote past. They are indeed in cold storage until the Reformation. But the Brutus story presents the Norman rulers of the islands with a foundation myth which they can absorb and appropriate as their own. And I say that's ironic because, of course, it entails overthrowing the entire logic of Nennius's Historia Britonum in favour of a people who have no ethnic connection at all with the ancient British. But Geoffrey is colossally successful in this enterprise and the story of Brutus's ancestry of the British becomes, as you'll know, normative right up until the 16th, 17th century. It's a renewed, reinvented British identity. The ancient identity that has been lost by the Welsh and was never possessed by the English becomes part of the British mythology of independence and empire. It's fascinating to see how the statement that this realm of England is an empire is dusted off and used in 16th century polemic, not least in the period of the Reformation. Henry VIII evidently sees himself as the heir of Brutus and Arthur in his battles with continental tyranny. So the greatest literary success of the writer of the Historia Britonum was also, in a sense, his greatest ideological failure. He develops and elaborates with some energy a classical or pseudo-classical mythology for the origins of Britain, and in the hands of a far more brilliant and creative writer, Geoffrey of Monmouth, it becomes an ideology which helps to justify the Plantagenet suppression of independent Welsh kingdoms. You could say then, going right back to where we started, that in this story of the inventions of British identities of various kinds through British libraries of various kinds, a sort of Romanitas, a sort of Romanness eventually triumphs through Geoffrey of Monmouth. But it's in a way quite foreign to the Romanitas of Gildas, say. <laughs> 
and Bede's doctrine of the displacement of the Canaanite British by the Israelite English is given a new twist by the Middle Ages. It's now the Normans who, superseding the English and the Welsh, become the inheritors not of a biblical but of a classical inheritance, a classical typology. And yet, at the same time, because of the way these histories have worked, by the 12th century, both English and Welsh identities are quite strong. The Welsh identity created in the Historia remains strong for Wales, the kingdom of Gwynedd, right up to its brutal suppression in the 13th century by Edward I, continues to generate these narratives and myths of essential Britishness. The prophecies of victory over the English are recycled and elaborated. Yet more poems are edited, reworked in the name of Taliesin and other ancient writers. And the sense remains strong of the Welsh as the true inheritors of the island. In England, we've seen how the English crown appropriated with um, a kind of insouciance the British origin legend and made it its own. So a number of things are going on by the High Middle Ages in the wake of all these historians. The new Britishness of Geoffrey of Monmouth gives ground for a new and wider doctrine of British, read English, exceptionalism. The English now standing in for the British, that's to say the Norman English and their successors in the High Middle Ages, have absorbed that legacy of what it is to be British, and it is an imperial legacy, not in the sense of global empire, but in the sense of radical political independence. You might even see in the legend of Brutus the remote ancestry of some of the rhetoric around Brexit. And the final flowering of this language of imperium and independence in the 16th century, as I've said, weaves itself in, in fascinating and subtle ways, with the polemic of the Reformation, not only against foreign rule, but in the name of a revived interest in the notion of the British people as chosen. The language around King Edward VI, for example, describing him as the new King Josiah or the new King Joash, underlines that sense that there is something about the English Christian identity which is analogous to the chosenness of ancient Israel. And that in turn does something to help and to animate the sense of mission behind the British Empire when it becomes the empire that we recognize from the 17th century onwards. But if there's anything to be learned from this trawling of otherwise unknown and abidingly obscure British libraries in the post-Roman period, I suppose it might be broken down into two elements. The one is very obvious, and that is that Britishness is always a project, always something which involves imagination and, yes, invention. It involves looking for analogues in the classical or the scriptural tradition. It involves finding a narrative. That's as true now as it was then. And one of the dangers against which we need to keep watch is the danger of supposing that there is an absolutely given, clear and authoritative narrative about what it is to be British, which was never invented or created or refined by any historian or poet at all. History suggests the contrary. At the same time, a second point is worth bearing in mind. For all the awkwardness of the language used by Gildas and Bede about the functional identity of a Christian race, British or Anglo-Saxon, with ancient Israel, both of them, Gildas consistently, Bede increasingly as he grew older, both those historians see the chosenness of this Christian chosen people 
as a cause not for self-congratulation, but for deep self-examination. It's a story not of unbroken success and victory, but a story of failure and betrayal, repentance and restoration. All national histories find it very difficult to cope with themes of repentance and restoration. They're comfortable with absolute victory or absolute defeat, absolute triumph or absolute victimhood. Paradoxically enough, the models around in Gildas and Bede, and to a lesser extent even in Nennius, are models that suggest that the creation of national and corporate identity does not necessarily leave out of account the need to confront failure, the need to consider what repentance might mean, and the need for narratives of hope and forgiveness. And so this brief set of reflections on the libraries of post-Roman Britain may perhaps leave us with a few interesting questions about what our own libraries are in thinking about national identity, even about national moral horizons. But that's a question I'm happy to leave you with. It's very bright up here. <laughs> um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Caroline Brazier, and I'm the uh, chief librarian here at the British Library. And I'm also on the uh, member of the Panizzi Selection Council. It's my great privilege and pleasure uh, this evening to give a vote of thanks to Dr. Ryan Williams for what I'm sure you will all agree with me has been an absolutely fascinating and wonderful series of lectures. The Selection Council, uh, uh, and there are uh, hopefully most of the members here this evening, has the very enjoyable task of drawing up a, um, a very long list of uh, possible speakers to give the Panizzi lectures. And then it has the very difficult task of selecting one uh, to invite each year. Um, and we're always looking for, clearly, the most outstanding speakers that we can think of. So I have to let you know that when Dr Williams was first suggested as a possibility, he shot straight to the top of our list. And we're delighted that he was able to find the time in an incredibly busy life to prepare and to give this, this year's lectures. The lectures have not, not only enlightened us about a period of history that is normally, uh, the history of these islands, which is normally considered dark, but he's done so with great clarity and great thought and with uh, an incredibly gentle humour. By examining the literary and the book culture of uh, the uh, the, of his chroniclers, and the culture of Britain, England, Wales, uh, and the identities that go with those, however you choose to define them. Um, through this, he's helped us to understand more clearly the links which existed between the earlier classical world and the, the, the early medieval world which followed. The, to me, this was a fascinating story of legacy, and continuity, which shaped not only people's thinking and their writings, but as he so clearly demonstrated, has shaped th uh, future generations and eras of thinking uh, about identity. So I, for one, have gained a much deeper understanding, not just of the individuals in as much as we can know about them, uh, including some fascinating insights into their, their characters, but also of the intellectual and the cultural world uh, through which they lived and wrote. And that context, the, co the clear context you've given us has been, has been wonderful. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank Dr. Williams most sincerely for this wonderful series of lectures and ask you all to join with me in giving him a warm round of applause. Thank you.
before I finish, I have two very short messages. The first one is by way of an advert. The Panizzi Lectures next year will be on the 4th, the 7th, and the 11th of December 2017, when our lecturer will be Professor Germaine Greer, who will be talking on the theme of Sappho Lost, Found, and Invented. So we cordially invite you to uh, come back and join us next year. And last but not least, to close this year's series, we now invite you all to join us for a drink and some light refreshments in the foyer. Thank you very much. <laughs>